Oh, don't start on that again. Yes, I know you could have theoretically simulated more futures of Doctor Strange and saved us all like three hours and a lot of money. It's not the point. Oh, hello. On the spectrum of really scary technology, you have both the incredibly large and the incomprehensibly small. On one end, you have planet-sized computers that tell you with 99% certainty how you're gonna die every day. Thanks, JB. And on the other end, you have machines so small they could mess with you molecularly. And on this side of the spectrum is where I want to stay today and examine one of the most famous technological apocalypses out there. What is gray goo? And how likely is it to end all life on Earth? <laughs> well, I'm gonna need some more coffee for this one. Oh. Now entering the facility. In his 1986 book, Engines of Creation, nanotechnology pioneer K. Eric Drexler was imagining machines so small they'd be smaller and simpler than any living thing. But like living things, he thought that these machines could be programmed to take material from the environment and use it to replicate themselves. You know, like humans do with alcohol and Netflix. In theory, these self-replicating nanomachines could be incredibly useful in everything from manufacturing to medicine, able to, with countless tiny atom-sized arms, disassemble anything and reassemble it element by element into anything else. Drexler's vision, though, came with a pretty big red flag. If tiny machines like this malfunction, Drexler speculated, then they might start disassembling stuff indiscriminately and taking all relevant fuel to replicate themselves on Earth's surface. Trees, Kevin, people, the atmosphere, Kevin, rivers, and they would be replicating too quickly for us to stop them. Drexler called this nanomachine nightmare gray goo. Now, I think most people, myself included, were under a misconception about what gray goo really means. Drexler didn't use this terminology to indicate color or texture. He meant bland and uninteresting. A nanomachine that could outcompete bacteria or any other flora or fauna on the planet Earth need not be evolutionarily fancy or interesting, just gray. This terrible capacity of a nanomachine replicator has now become a sci-fi staple and to really understand why, you need to grasp exponential growth. There are a number of ways to describe how some value can increase over time. And the first, linear growth, is I think the easiest to understand. So if something is increasing by a consistent amount over some time period, like your hair growing a millimeter or five millimeters every month, that is linear growth. There's also polynomial growth, where some value is increasing to some fixed exponent over time, like squared or cubed. And finally, what we're concerned with, exponential growth is when some value is increasing to an exponent, but that exponent depends on time. A population of bacteria doubling themselves every few minutes is an example of exponential growth, as is the number of expanding COVID-19 cases among very, very intelligent people on Florida beaches. Now, as you can see from the graph, the danger with exponential growth specifically is that things can get out of control very quickly. And, oh, I need my TI-89 titanium for this next bit. One second. Hey, so has anyone seen Kyle and Felicity Smoke from Arrow in the same room at the same time? Just saying. Now, if you've ever been exposed to exponential growth, it was likely in the context of high school biology, so let's start with the equations usually found there. The exponential growth equation in its general form is P equals P-E-R-T. Now, I remember it as PERT because that's a kind of champy champ, but what it says is some exponentially growing population is equal to the initial population size multiplied by the irrational number E to the power of some growth rate constant times time. Now, we need to figure out why Drexler would be so worried about nanobots, so let's use a more realistic example with high school biology and bacteria. So if we have one bacteria that, say, doubles its population size every 20 minutes, we can solve for the growth rate constant with a little bit of math, and then we can start plugging in time values to see how much bacteria we'd end up with. So I'm gonna go with a little under 48 hours or two days, and we end up with, now that's a lot of bacteria. 
But I chose the 48 hours figure very intentionally because if each bacteria weighs about a trillionth of a gram, then in under 48 hours, under perfect conditions, a single bacteria could grow into a colony that weighs more than the planet Earth. Yeah. Similarly, theoretically, nanobots could explode in the same way, and you could see why Drexler might be worried about that. But like I said, these are perfect conditions, and this is just math on your standard TI-89 titanium, not a sponsor. Would this ever come to pass in the real world? No, but seriously, has anyone seen them together? It's weird, right? Like many more realistic world-ending scenarios, Grey Goo has become very popular across all forms of sci-fi media, and the nerds who have written these stories have thought up a lot more colors than just gray. Take the nerds at the website Orion's Arm. They've thought up khaki goo, which is military and weaponized nanotechnology, the blue goo that fights off this more malicious nanotechnology, and even the golden goo, which is released into the environment with the specific intent on picking out precious materials like gold from something like seawater. Like a nanotechnology apocalypse, human inventiveness knows no bounds. <coughs> now that we understand exponential growth, we can use that knowledge to evaluate the likelihood of death by a trillion tiny hands picking you apart until there's nothing left but molecular sludge and nanomachines. <laughs> The first real scientific dissection of this nanomachine apocalypse was in 2000 by Robert Freitas Jr. in a paper entitled Some Limits to Global Ecophagy by Biivorous Nanoreplicators. And in this paper, he used some extrapolations of current nanotechnology and a lot of math to give some timetables for the worst case gray goo scenario. First, we need to evaluate the machines. What are they? Well, at their simplest, there may be 70 million atoms constructed into a base, a power source, and a tiny manipulator arm. And Freitas Jr. was thinking of this arm moving at maybe one centimeter per second, performing a million atomic pick-and-place operations. And for fuel, they'd be using anything available on the surface of Earth. If we just look at carbon, like Freitas Jr. did, then we're talking about roughly 23% of the mass of the bio sphere on Earth, 23% of everything that you probably care about, even Lola. Easy girl, it's just a hypothetical. No? What's arrow? Now we use our exponential growth math. What we want to know is how long it will take a single rogue nanoreplicator to turn all the available carbon on Earth into gray gooby, leaving just sludge and other nanobots behind, so let's plug in some numbers. Estimating both the carbon in the biosphere and the mass of a single nanobot that replicates every 100 seconds or so, a reasonable time according to Freitas Jr., we can start guessing how long death by Grey Goo will take. Do the diligence here and you find that more or less everything on the surface of Earth will become either Grey Goo nanomachine or molecular sludge in under two hours. Think about this, in some future sci-fi scenario, a scientist unfortunately drops a beaker on the ground and then before someone on the other side of the planet has time to watch a movie and then leave their theater, everything is either a little nanomachine picking apart things atom by atom or useless, shapeless, bleh. It's an incredibly, breathtakingly swift end to civilization, and a nanoreplicator's ability to do this is why this idea has endured as apocalyptic for so long. And yes, that is a badass term that I just coined. Oh, what's that? Oh, movie theaters, oh, sorry. Movie theaters were places where dozens of people used to gather for hours and watch movies and cough on each other's nachos. I know, it, it's crazy. I can't even imagine a time when people did that. Since we're getting technical here, you know we can't just leave it at that because yes, in theory, replicating nanomachines could spiral out of control very quickly, but in the real world, they'd be limited by real world factors like geography, available fuel, ambient temperature, and even shape of the swarm as it spreads out. And so the study that we've been considering by Freitas Jr. looked at a more plausible scenario, an accidental release of a single nanobot into the Earth's atmosphere. Now, if the Earth's atmosphere has an average wind speed, average wind speed of around 10 meters per second, then with a lot of math, which we won't go through today, Freitas Jr. concludes that it would take not two days to cover every square meter of the Earth's surface, but 30 days. 
Yeah, that's still bad, but we'd see it coming. Now arriving. Oh, gotta mask up because I will, I'll be near other people and I'm conscientious and there's a pandemic, so. Hey, putting on that mask looked pretty easy. <laughs> You're right, Aria. It was easy. Once we start to factor in more realistic variables, the idea of Grey Goo being an end to all life on Earth starts to, well, disassemble itself. You see, in conversations about Grey Goo, I've almost never seen something very important mentioned that Dr. Freitas points out, and that's waste heat. Now, machines don't just whir through the environment and do their little business. They have to lose some energy to the environment in the form of heat. That's just how thermodynamics works. That's important here because these little machines in that two-day doomsday scenario would be putting out so much heat they'd be literally vaporizing the fuel they were trying to use. Like, incinerating entire cows and stuff. And this would force the swarm to move more slowly. It would have to. And this isn't considering a world where nanobots are a thing. They're not now. You'd imagine that when nanobots were a possible apocalyptic, that we'd have agencies and satellites on the watch for thermal signatures of rogue swarms. And if they were thermally undetectable against background, Freya's Jr. estimates, they would have to move so much more slowly than even the 30 days, more like 20 months. Now, when you put all of this together and not even including safeguards against apocalypse tech and uh, defense countermeasures and all that stuff, it just doesn't seem like this is a really plausible end of the world. Grey goo, I think you can scratch it off your 2020 bingo card. Until next time, I'm Felicity. I'm Kyle. I'm me. Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for their direct and substantial support in the creation of this video. Today, especially, I want to recognize research assistant Neil Hugenhout and visiting scholar Shelby Bradford. If you want to get on the facility staff today, if you want to join the over 1,200 nerds that are on Discord, talking to me 24-7, giving me episode ideas, getting episodes a day early, having private live streams with me, not those kinds that don't have an OnlyFans, and show me in their pictures of dogs and cats and spiders and stuff, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and get on the staff today. And if you support the facility just enough, you get your name on Aria here each and every week. And as you can see, there's literally hundreds of you. So I don't know how to pass the Drexler to his credit, didn't just put the gray, the gray goo idea out there and just let it run over science fiction, not say anything. He spent a lot of time in his career talking about Stop focusing on gray goo, it's not plausible. We should really be trying to get ready for the coming nanotechnology revolution and focus on f more plausible ideas instead of this fun, but probably not gonna happen thing. And yes, I know I'm focusing a lot on gray goo, you know, like many minutes and hundreds of thousands of eyeballs on it. And it's, it's not a basilisk situation, it's fine, right? Thanks for watching.